Welcome back to the School for Writers podcast. If you happened to miss it last episode, we have a little format change we're doing here halfway through season two. We're about to end season two in October, beginning of November. And for the last few episodes, I wanted to try something new. And that's something new is that in place of where I used to have an ad selling you something exciting and wonderful that we have to offer you, I'm going to just talk with you about what's happening around here, both at School for Writers and in my life. And I would love to have you be a part of that. I would love to have a conversation with some of you. So if you have a question for me, if you have something you'd like me to address on here, or if you want to have a conversation with me on the podcast, find me at info at laurenmarieflemming.com. Slide into my DMs on Instagram at Lauren Marie Fleming. Slide into my DMs at School for Writers. And let's talk. So today on the podcast, I have Katie Tregadin. And I'm probably destroying that last name because Katie has a wonderful Cornwallian accent and I cannot replicate it. And if y'all like I got my hick accent. That's that's the accent I can do. My hometown accent of like a little hickness. I can do my Mexicali Spanish accent that when I go to Mexico City, they laugh and say I sound like a hick, which actually clocks pretty well. Um, so I am excited to have Katie on even when I can't pronounce her last name properly in the proper accent. But Katie is one of those people that I met through a entrepreneur group that I'm in. And we're in a pod and we meet every week to talk about our businesses. And when I met Katie, it feels like there's just layers on layers and layers on the amazing stuff that she's done as a writer, as a journalist, as somebody who has has a passion, such a strong passion for getting people to start to think about waste and the way we waste and how we can reuse waste or prevent it to begin with. We talk a lot about environmentalism and sustainability and all those buzzwords that people have thrown around, but Katie gives you some actual tangible tips for thinking about creating with the end result in mind, creating with our impact in mind. And you all know how much I appreciate thinking about impact first. When I start a book, I always ask myself, where do I want people to read this? And what do I want them to feel when they do read this? So, you know, my book, Body Love, 10 Steps to Profoundly Loving Your Body, I wanted people to feel like they had a permission slip to love their body and their life. Because I wrote it because I needed a permission slip to love my fat body, to love my mentally, neurally diverse body, to love my queer body, my hairy body, my not quite a woman, not quite a guy. Yeah, I identify as a woman, but I'm also kind of not, I don't know, this is my body and it's weird and it's like makes noises and like it has fluids and I wanted permission to accept my body where it was. So I wrote that permission slip. And every time I wanted someone to read that book, I wanted them to read that permission slip. When I wrote my novel that I'm shopping out right now that's tentatively named BFG, that sounds for something, but I don't want to say the whole thing because I love the title. Um, When it's out and shopping, I keep getting, I keep getting agents rejecting it and I keep getting publishers rejecting it because they say that it's about a queer woman falling in love with a man. And I remember when I went to go write it, I had a conversation with somebody that was like, Lauren, you and I couldn't be friends anymore if you started dating men because my wife wouldn't be okay with it. This was a really close friend of mine who was a man. And I remember thinking that that was really messed up and that that we have all these stories about people who are tragically coming out. You know, it's always tragic, right? Those are the only stories that people want to write about marginalized or like publish about marginalized people is our trauma. We should celebrate our joy too. This is why I love queer romance. But in romance in general and diverse romance in general, shout out to an amazing article by Jasmine Guillory in Time Magazine. If you haven't read it yet about Black Joy, go get that. We'll put it in the show links. So as I'm putting the story out, I keep getting these these people responding saying, that's not the bisexual narrative that we want to read. That's not the queer narrative we want to read. Like a queer person 
discovering that they might be bisexual is not the story we want. A lesbian discovering she's bisexual, no. A straight girl, uh, like someone literally was like, change the character's gender and have it be a straight girl realizing she's gay and I could sell this tomorrow. And like, how messed up is that, y'all? I, this was the thing I was struggling with. Okay, real talk. I had a dream that The Rock wanted to date me and I turned him down because I couldn't imagine what it would do to my life being a gay person, an out gay person who then was dating an like publicly a straight person or in a seemingly straight relationship or somebody who identified as straight, but me identifying as gay. I also couldn't imagine somebody like as chiseled as the rock wanting to date someone fat like me. And I woke up from that dream where I turned him down, not because I didn't love him, not because I wasn't attracted to him. I mean, come on, it's the rock, y'all. But because I couldn't handle the societal structures around what it would mean to date someone like The Rock if you're someone like me. And so I wrote a book about it. And that's awesome. And I have given this book. So I did. I haven't been able to get it traditionally published. I want to traditionally publish this book, this particular book. My last book, I self-published this particular book, though. I want to traditional publish it. And I've been really thinking about what it means to like wait for gatekeepers to ha let me have my book on my shelf. So I printed a bunch of copies. I used Barnes and Noble print. They and it was like $10 a copy and I printed 10 copies. I spent like 120 bucks with shipping to get myself 10 copies and I gave it to friends that I knew also were queer but sometimes were in situations in which they were read as heterosexual. And they have all said that they see themselves in this book so much and they needed this narrative so much in their life. It felt like a permission slip. So I think a lot about how what we write is a permission slip. What we say is a permission slip. How we live our lives is a permission slip. And I think that this interview with Katie is a permission slip for a couple things. One, I think it's a permission slip to do our best as people living in an environment that is changing rapidly and not in a good way. Our climate change is real, climate change is happening, and we're seeing waste pile up and it can make us feel like we don't have a right to create because we might just be creating more waste. And Katie and I delve into that. And it's really, really beautiful, her response to that. So listen up to it. I think it's also a permission slip to niche down. Katie and I talk about how the more specific, tiny little specific she got, the more she actually expanded. She writes about a very particular thing now. She used to write about sustainable design. Lots of people write about sustainable design. Now she writes about this one little part of what she calls the circular economy. And she has a book out called Wasted, all about how to take waste material, prevent waste material, and to take waste material and create from it. She has a course on this. She's created a whole world around this. It's amazing. All because she niched down really tight. So I have so many people be like, I don't want to be known for just X. I was sitting at the dentist's office. I don't know, probably a year ago, an old dentist I decided not to go to after this conversation. And the, the dental tech was like, what do you do? And I said, oh, I'm a writer. And she's like, oh, what do you write? Which is a question I freaking I hate answering because there's it's like complicated, but not, but it's like weird. And I don't want to like, I have shame around some of it. It's weird. Like back in the day, I'm like, oh yeah, you know, like do I tell them I used to write about porn? And like, that's what I'm known for. Do I write about like body image? That's what I was known for a while. Or do I write about writing now? Like, what do I say? How do I answer that? But the thing I usually say is I write stories about fat queer women. And she said, she was like, why would you ever want to write a story about a fat queer woman? <laughs> I was like, because I'm fat and I'm queer. And I want to read stories like me about people like me. And she like was weirded out by me for the rest of the time. And, you know, this lady's like has her hands in my mouth and, just, you know, <laughs> chewing my teeth. So I think about how niche that feels, right? Like I'm going to write about fat queer people. How many percentage of people out there is fat and queer? And let me tell you, as I'm out there on dating apps <laughs> trying to uh, get laid, it's hard to find people that are queer that are fat and queer, that are feminine queer, like that are entrepreneurs and queer. Like I am a niche, I am a niche, but if I exist, then 
there's got to be others that exist. And as I meet more and more people like me, I realize that the more I'm niche and talk to people who want to hear the stories I want to tell, the more I actually have these deep connections with people. So Katie is going to help you figure out how to get that niche. And then we're also going to give you permission to create a world around your writing and not have writing just be the thing you're going to do. I think that Katie has done this brilliantly, and I've watched her grow over the past year or so that I've known her, to create a course around her book, to create a movement around her book, to create a podcast around her book, to create this world, books. She has multiple books, but especially this one book, Wasted. She has this whole world that she's created as a business owner that allows her to do writing full time and to keep writing. And it all just like feeds into each other. So we're going to give you permission for that. And then I know there said there were three things, but here's a fourth. We're also going to give you permission to see your writing as a movement, which can feel overwhelming at first, but all you have to do is change one person. And you're going to hear Katie talk about that one person she changed. So this is a good episode, y'all. It's a really good episode. And I hope that you enjoy this conversation with Katie as much as I do. I am serious when I say I want to have conversations with you. So come find me on Instagram at Lauren Marie Fleming. Slide into my DMs. Tell me what you learned from this episode. And tell me what you think of this new intro podcast system and style I'm going to try. We've got eight-ish episodes at the end of, till the end of season two. And we're going to give this a try for a while. I'm excited for it. I hope you're excited for it too. And if you're just listening on the podcast, I'm just going to say that you should go onto my YouTube so you can see these really cool Saturn earrings I'm wearing because they're these giant silver earrings that look like Saturn. That's it. Just a little moment of superficiality before we head into the interview with Katie Tregenden. Enjoy this episode. I hope it helps you feel more able to be yourself and give yourself permission to follow the things that you're passionate about. Enjoy the episode. We're already laughing, folks. This is going to be a great episode. Welcome, Trey, Katie Trigidden. We had a whole conversation about my bad British accent saying your last name. But welcome to the podcast, Katie. I am so excited to have you here. Why don't you tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do in this world? Sure. Thank you so much for having me. And that was perfect pronunciation of my surname. So yes, well done. I was practicing. <laughs> Um, I am a journalist, author, podcaster, and keynote speaker, and I specialize in the overlaps between craft and design and sustainability. So I'm really interested in understanding how people who make with their hands can help with a just transition to a circular economy or can help to inspire and empower people to make that transition. I love that. And I know you very well from us being in a group together this past year. And I love your book, Wasted. That's all about all of that. And today we're going to talk a lot about the book writing process and just the process in general. But I also want to ask you, okay, I'm going to get to so much questions because some of the stuff you just said, I was like, what does all that mean? And that sounds so cool. And I even know you and I don't know the definition of circular economy and all that stuff. But before I geek out on all the amazingness that is in your head, let's start with the first question that I ask everybody who comes on the podcast. And that is, why writing? Why writing? I think I've got two answers to this question. Okay, I like it. One, I think it's because I can't see myself ever doing anything else. Mm. I've wanted to be a writer since I was five. I've always had my, I had a primary school teacher who whenever she would bump into me around the town and inevitably I would have my nose in a book, she would always say, send me a copy of your first book, Katie. And I did when I got my first book published, which was amazing. Um, but I think I spent a long time doing other things and on other paths. And I think I finally come home. And I think writing is probably the thing that makes me happiest. It's, it's where I get into that state of flow where I'm not really aware of anything else that's going on. And I'm completely... Um, sort of immersed in what I'm doing and lose track of time and all that wonderful stuff so I think firstly because I think I'm I'm a writer is why I write um and the other reason I think is because of the power of storytelling so when my second book came out which was called Makers of East London I got an email from someone who had quit their job in London and moved to the countryside to set up as a maker as a result of having read my book and I thought oh god what have you done <laughs> That's 
goals right there unbelievable so this was someone called jeremy brown who runs a thankfully very successful <laughs> studio called feldspar and they're doing really well much to my relief but that really made me realize the power of what i was what i was doing and so now i write specifically as i said about this idea of, of craft design and sustainability and how people who make with their hands can save the world and and my intention is absolutely now to inspire those sorts of decisions and transitions and and transformations so yeah i think storytelling is really powerful oh i love that one of the stories that i've heard you tell recently that i love is you have a really great master class that people can learn about the circular economy so i i'm assuming Correct me if I'm wrong, the circular economy means that you like reduce, reuse, recycle, like we call it in the United States. Like, tell me about the circular economy. Yeah, so that's part of it. Um, the Ellen MacArthur Foundation has the best definition and they talk about the three tenets of the circular economy. So the first one is to design out waste and pollution. So in a truly circular economy, there would be no waste and there would be no pollution. The second one is to keep materials and objects in use which is where reduce, reuse and recycle, I guess, comes in. So that's about repairing things so that we can use them for longer. And when they can't be repaired anymore, taking them apart and reusing their constituent elements or their materials to do other things. And then the final one is about regenerating natural systems. And I think this is the bit we often forget. We tend to spend a lot of time thinking about how we can do less harm, but in a truly circular economy, we're actively doing good and human activity is beneficial to the natural environment. And so the reason I specifically tend to talk about the circular economy rather than something broader like sustainability is that it's very tangible, it's very actionable. You can immediately assess something to see how close it is to a circular model. Whereas words like sustainability are brilliantly broad and they encompass all sorts of things, but equally that means all sorts of things get shoved into them that probably shouldn't. And that's where you get greenwashing. So that's why I'm particularly keen on, on this circular model because it is so clearly defined. I am here for that because that feels doable. You just gave me three action steps that I can do as somebody who's, you know, very concerned about the environment around me. Um, and also I'm going to go plant more plants now. <laughs> that, that last one made me, made me want to plant more plants. Um, so you have that and you have a course. And the thing I was going to say that I love the story you tell um, when you promote this masterclass that you have is you talk a lot about the way in which creators are starting to feed and crafters and, and makers are starting to feel really guilty putting something out in the world. And that actually really resonated with me because I had somebody recently say, they don't wanna write a book because there's too much deforestation happening and they don't want their book to be a part of deforestation. And they couldn't do it digitally because the digital space is also like these data mine places are also destroying the world. So they didn't wanna write a book. And I, we worked through it. It was a lot of, it was like a lot of procrastination, but there was something real in that. They didn't want to write a book because they were worried about deforestation and these giant data processing centers that requires for digital. And we have so much shame over being creators because we see creating as potentially harming the environment. So what would you say to people that have that story in their head? Yeah. I mean, that's certainly something I've found. I think when I I've been working in the creative industries for about 20 years. And when I first started talking to designer makers, they were so proud of what they did. You know, they made with their hands and they made these beautiful, valuable objects. And I think probably in the last maybe five years, there's been this creeping sense of guilt about putting more stuff into the world, as you say. And I think the idea of trying to be more sustainable kind of sits really heavily on their shoulders. It feels like a burden or sort of responsibility. And I don't think you can create from that place. You know, I don't think you can create from a place of guilt and, and heaviness. And so one of the things I'm trying to do is encourage and empower designer makers to engage with sustainability in a more playful, creative, sort of curiosity filled way. And actually the reason we, we feel so bad about putting stuff into the world is because of the linear take make waste model. So this idea that we take virgin resources out of the earth, we make something from them, and then the other, the other way of explaining that is the take, make, use, lose model. So you use it and then eventually it's lost and it, it becomes waste. It ends up in landfill, what have you. Um, specifically to your book example, I had exactly the same fear when I wrote a book about waste. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know what well, I was creating all these new things 
um, that hopefully aren't going to end up in landfill. Hopefully they have captured carbon and will stay on somebody's bookshelf for a very long time. But we actually made the cover of the book from waste. So we made it from a so uh, cool. byproduct of the leather processing industry. Um, the paper, it, really interestingly, and this is where some of the complexities of sort of sustainability comes in. I really wanted to use recycled paper. The only way we could re use recycled paper and bring the book in at a price point, which meant its message would reach the people we wanted it to reach was by having it printed in China, which would have meant shipping lots of books from China to Europe and America, where most of my books are sold. And actually the carbon footprint of that shipping cost outweighed the benefit of printing on recycled paper. So we chose to print on FSC certified paper instead, which is the most sustainable virgin wood you can get. But you know, that's absolutely a compromise and not what I'm super comfortable with, but that was the best that we sort of got to. Um, and your client's right about um, Kindles. People tend to assume that digital products are less damaging than uh, sort of physical products, but the, they all have to be stored in databases, which have to be A, powered by electricity and B, cooled. So the carbon footprint of digital projects is, is often a lot heavier than that of um, sort of physical products. Um, yeah, and then we also poly wrapped it in something that looked like plastic, but was actually a byproduct of the sugar processing industry. So again, it was made from waste. So I did everything I could to minimize the impact of the book and decided that its message would sort of outweigh the damage that it did. But I think, I think that's a big part of it is I don't think there are perfect solutions yet. And I think in everything we do, it's about reaching the best compromise. And I think that's something that we're really exploring in the masterclass, because I think a lot of the students came in hoping for some magic bullet. And actually, um, it's going to be more a question of working out which compromise sits right with their values and which compromise sits right with their business. And I think there's a there's a wonderful quote on a podcast called How to Save a Planet. And they were talking about the fact that so many people are still waiting for one silver bullet technological solution to the climate crisis, whereas actually it's going to take tens of thousands of us trying and failing and trying again. And I mm -hmm. found that comforting and inspiring at the same time. I don't think I had really until this moment, like literally the second thought about environmental activism as creativity. Like I would tell everybody like try and then don't and then try and then fail and try and fail. Like that's the creative process. And the mm. way you just explained cre like saving the earth basically, or like at least prolonging our destruction of it um, is feels very much like a creative cycle. And I love that you bring that in because you give us permission to be creative and bring creativity into this. Cause I feel like there's so much pressure and it's so whitewashed and it's so, like privileged, but also it's not because we used to, you know, you had a really great episode about darning. Like I never thought like, how do, I don't know how to fix my stuff. So I have to get new stuff. And that's actually like making me have to spend more money and do more things. So I love so much of what you said, but let's talk a little bit about that whole, how do you negotiate with a publisher? You're like, I'm going to write a book. And I'm glad I got a publishing. Like most people just be glad they got a publishing deal and that the publisher have whatever they want. Let's, how do you even negotiate recycled leather byproduct and plastic byproduct and whether we go to recycle? Like, how do you even negotiate something like that with a publisher? So I'm in a very privileged position in that this is my third book with this publisher. So we okay. have a really good relationship. We've been working together for a very long time. And when they came to me with this book idea, and it was their idea. I don't, I don't think, I think they thought I'd like it. I don't think they real, realized quite how much I was going to run with it. <laughs> um, but they came to me with this idea and I said, I'll do it on, I think I said, I'll do it on three conditions. One that we call it wasted. They're a Belgian publisher. So it took me a little while to explain the British humor involved there. Uh, two, that we make it out of waste and three, that we don't wrap it in plastic. And I said, I want those things written in my contract. And they said, look, we're not writing those things in your contract, Katie, but we will do our best, you know, hand on heart. And so the name we got through, the fact it would be made from waste, we got through. And then at the last minute, they said we were planning to wrap it in this potato starch that uh, newspaper supplements come sometimes come wrapped in. So it's a sort of uh, opaque, translucent, um, again, looks a bit like plastic, but isn't. And it turned out that it's fine to wrap newspaper supplements in that because it only needs to last for days. But it starts to degrade and they print their entire print run at once. So whatever they wrap it in needs to last for more than a year. 
and this poly wrap wasn't going to last for that long. So they said, I'm so sorry, but we're going to have to wrap it in plastic. And this is like days before it's going to print. And I was just like, you can't, you can't, like, we will get slaughtered on social media if this book turns up wrapped in single wrap plastic. And so I was like, can we please just try harder? And they went away and did a bunch of research and I went away and did a bunch of research. And eventually we found this uh, sucrose based uh, sort of bioplastic, I suppose, that's completely compostable. It looks exactly like plastic. It lasts as long as plastic. And actually we did get a bit of a backlash on social media from people who thought it was plastic. <laughs> so we had to manage that. But what's brilliant is the publisher has now decided to roll that out across all their books. So they are no longer using single use plastic. Isn't that amazing? So look at what standing up for yourself in the publishing industry or any industry can do for the future too. Right? Yeah. Um, I didn't and it's, know that. That's amazing. Yeah. And it was such a brilliant result because actually it works just as well as plastic. It doesn't cost a lot more um, and it's not causing harm to the environment. So having this one book, which they took a bit of a punt on because I stuck my feet in, <laughs> um, has now benefited all the books that they publish, which is yeah, fantastic news. And I hope that will have a ripple effect further across the publishing industry. Yeah. I love that. Tell me a little bit about your other two books. I know a lot about Wasted. And I love what you do around Wasted and around the circular economy. But tell me about uh, your other two books. I don't, I, I feel kind of bad. I feel like I only love one of your children. I don't know the other two. <laughs> so the other two I've done with this publisher, one is called Weaving and the other one is called Urban Potters. Um, and Urban Potters was specifically about a phenomenon that my publisher had noticed where people were doing pottery in cities, which seems like quite a strange thing to do because pottery is something that requires a lot of space and it's quite messy and doing it in tiny apartments in places like Tokyo and London and New York seemed a little bit bonkers. So we sort of looked into it. Um, and yeah, so it profiles, I think, about 25 potters working in five cities around the world. And then Weaving has a slightly different format, but profiles people who are working with um, making woven fabrics. And I think rather than cities that time, we picked themes. So I wrote about weaving and feminism. I wrote about weaving and migration and sort of picked up these as soon as you start researching weaving, you start getting these themes coming through and they just felt like these big one of the things I love about writing about craft and design is you can see the whole world in any object once you really dig into it. And so I, I really enjoyed doing that with the weaving book, sort of talking about these huge themes that had come out of a simple piece of woven fabric. I see the journalist in you coming out in these stories. So you said those are with this publisher. Do you have books with another publisher? Yeah, so my first book was a book called Interviews, which I self-published, I think, in 2010. And that was um, just a collection of interviews with designers. Um, everybody from an illustrator who just graduated right through to Vim Crowell, who is the godfather of graphic design. So there was a real mix of people in there. And then my second book was called Makers of East London, and that was published by Hoxton Mini Press. And that's the one that inspired that guy to leave his job in London and become a maker. So yeah, that was my first sort of properly published book. Do you get a discount like on his stuff? Like you're like, yo, dude, oh, I was your inspiration. No. Come on. Come on. Dude, You'd think so. <laughs> get it together. <laughs> yeah. Um, I have a saying whenever um, people ask about discounts, there's a saying in the publishing industry and I might have just made it up myself, but it's um, a friend asks for a copy of your book and reads it all the way through and loves it. A good friend buys five copies of your book, gives it to everybody they know, and makes them read it all the way through as well. So I feel like, okay, you don't have to get a discount. You inspire them, fine. <laughs> but still, get a discount. I love that. And I can think of the exact friend of mine who does that every time I publish a book as well. <laughs> yeah, I try to buy at least three copies of friends' books and give them out to people because that's what we really want, right? We really want our stories to circulate not just in our circles, but to get out there and inspire people to leave their jobs and move to the countryside. <laughs> yeah, I love that. So how did you, how, did, so, okay. I have a couple questions. I just want to know how you started as a writer. Let's start from the beginning. So I see you now you've created and y'all, this is what I tell you a lot to talk about is to think about what you can create around your book. So Katie's a great example. There's the book Wasted, which could be enough, but then there's now courses and programs and speaking. There's so much around the book, around this topic that you just spent all this time on. And even fiction people, you can do this as well. It's not just nonfiction. So I'd love to know where that got started. Like, how did you decide 
to start doing this thing called writing as a professional? I think if you ask my parents, they will tell you that I always talk too much as a child. <laughs> and I was always writing stories and poems and all that sort of thing. So I think a certain amount of it is just innate. But my writing career started when I set up a blog in 2010 called Confessions of a Design Geek. And at the time I was working in the corporate world, I was working in advertising, sort of big ad agencies, and I knew I wanted to do something more creative. So I started exploring different things, trying on different hats. So I did a couple of interior design qualifications. I did life drawing classes, photography classes, pottery classes, screen printing classes, you know, sort of evening classes, summer schools, all of this sort of stuff. And somebody said to me, you should write a blog. And I just laughed and brushed it off. And he said, no, seriously. And he pulled up a blog called Design Sponge, which was the American interior design Grace Bonnie. blog at the time, the incredible Grace Bonnie, and said, you could be the next Grace Bonnie. <laughs> at that point, I really laughed and was just like, yeah, I don't think so. But I was living in a tiny, tiny flat at the time, and I didn't have space to store all the exhibition leaflets and stuff that I was picking up. So I thought, well, at least if I wrote a blog, then I could get rid of the leaflet and I would still have it all documented somewhere. So my first blog was really a storage solution. <laughs> That's brilliant. That's brilliant. It, it got me writing 500 words every Sunday. Um, and I slowly realized that actually what I loved was learning about craft and design and writing about craft and design. And it wasn't so much, I don't really have the patience to be a designer maker. I'm. It's a very iterative process and I am not... <laughs> I'm not a very patient person. So, um, although weirdly I can move sentences around forever. So I think maybe it's just that I found my craft and that was the craft of writing. Um, yeah, and then the blog got nominated for an award five weeks after I launched it, which wow. it went on to win, which was slightly bonkers. It was the My Deco Best Interior Design blog in Great Britain. Um, Congratulations. We have an award-winning writer here, folks. I love, I love that I get to stick award winning in front of my name because yes. of that one little award 10 years ago. Um, and then Design Milk, another big American design blog, were advertising for an editor and I applied for the job um, and didn't get it, but did get the job of editor at large covering the London Design Festival for them. So while I was still working in advertising, I had these two side hustles on the go. And then one day I walked into the office in the middle of a conference call, which had been scheduled in the knowledge that I couldn't make the first part of it and my creative director held up a post-it note saying they're closing the office we've all lost our jobs and it was just this <sighs> moment where my whole world fell apart my identity was so bound up in being good at that job we just bought a house with a big mortgage on the basis of that job mm -hmm. um and I sort of fell apart for a bit and then I thought you know what this could actually be a blessing in disguise I was on three months notice so I had three months salary owed to me from that moment and I thought and this is advertising money so that's kind of six months six months writer's money <laughs> <laughs> that's a thing yeah uh -huh. um although we'll bust some of those myths I'm sure yep um but I gave myself six months to to make it as a writer um and my family were all also I was bonkers my husband said as long as I could pay my half of the mortgage he was in <laughs> Um, so yeah, I started doing freelance writing, started working as a journalist, um, actually worked for an amazing cancer charity who are very involved in the design industry in this country for six months to sort of, well, in fact, almost a year, I think, part time. Um, and that was my sort of transition into, into writing full time. But I've always done public speaking. I've always had a very active Instagram account. I think I, I think for me, the process is about learning and gathering as much as I possibly can about a subject and then there's some sort of magic black box in the middle where that gets distilled into something interesting and then it comes out in the form of public speaking or books or articles or and I think it's as long as I'm telling those stories I think those, they can be told in lots of different media. Yeah I hadn't really thought about being a writer as being a digester but I think mm. I've said it in different ways than that, but I think that feels like a really tangible, easy to understand thing that we are, right? We are people who go out and experience life, read, do things, 
digest it and then put it into our work, however that comes out. And I hadn't, you know, one of the things in my Write Your Friggin' Book Already program that I require people to do, and even in my Path to Published programs, all of my programs really, is I require them to take time off to go live their lives because you're not a great writer unless you've lived. And it sounds like you have been collecting for ever. It sounds mm -hmm. like this interest in this particular subject. And I think that we often think of writers as like Stephen King who can write about anything, but there's a beauty in becoming really knowledgeable in one little tiny, I mean, those, for those that are watching on YouTube, you can see this, but those in the podcast, you know, Katie's fingers got really small there when talking about the black box, like you could barely see through it. And that is the kind of niche I want you all to think about having is that tiny little thing that you know so much about that you could come on a podcast and talk about. You could write a yeah. whole series of books on. And maybe for some of you, that thing is horror. Maybe for some of you, that thing is romance. Maybe for some of you, that thing is waste economy, whatever your thing that you could talk about forever in multiple books. And I think I've my whole career, I've been niching down and niching down and niching down. And every time I do it again, it's terrifying because every mm -hmm. time you niche down, you think, oh, but I'm missing out on all this other stuff. But actually the opposite is true. The more I niche down, the more work I get. The more I niche down, the more ideas I have. And so I think it's it's sort of a bow tie shaped um, diagram for those who are listening. There's all the stuff that goes in and then you niche right down, but then it opens right back up again. And mm -hmm. I think it it feels counterintuitive, but actually the tinier your niche, the better. Because then, you know, I used to write about purpose-driven craft and design. Well, so do a lot of people. Whereas now I write about craft and the circular economy. There aren't so many people writing about that. Um, so when somebody needs someone to do a keynote speech or write an article in a newspaper, it's more likely to be me that they think of to do that. Yeah. I, I find that you brought up a really good point because that niching half of what I deal with towards the end of the Write Your Freaking Book Already program is people being like, but I don't want to turn off certain audiences. And yeah. so often the audience that we're trying to not turn off are the people that at some point told us there was something wrong with us and we're like still trying to prove them, even if that's not directly. But like, I want anyone to be able to pick up my book. Well, do you? Do you want your like crazy racist great aunt over there who lives in a bunker and doesn't talk to anybody to pick up your book? No. So why would you want some like knowing who you really are talking to helps you have be able to tell more of your truth and more of your story because you're not trying to appease and please everybody. So I love yeah. that you've just like embraced your niche. It's so good. And yeah. you're killing it in your niche like you're it's it's amazing watching you progress to niching down because yeah as you say that like I'm seeing more and more opportunities come to you as you do that niche yeah I think you're right and I think having stepped into the online business world with launching my masterclass, there's a thing that happens on sales pages where you have this is for you if and this is not for you if and you know what when you're reading that this is not for you if it's for you everything on that list makes you go yes 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 and I think you've almost if you try to be everything to everybody it's a sort of meh response whereas when you really focus on your people yes you're going to alienate people but your people will know that they're your people and I think there's something really exciting about that about kind of really connecting with people and that's where you get kind of super fans who will you know, follow you to book signings and all of that sort of thing. Not that that's happened to me, but <laughs> I'm an, I'm a super fan. I'm going to start following you to book signings. <laughs> I mean, you're half a world away, so it's a little bit hard, but <laughs> yeah. we'll make it happen. We'll make it happen. So you also have a podcast and I listen to your podcast because I'm not a maker, but there's beauty in hearing the stories of these makers and I um I grew up, my mother is a big maker. She's a needlepoint artist. She's a fiber artist. And she used to sew and do other things, but she's really niched down to needlepoint. And my sister paints needlepoint canvases and needlepoints and does some knitting. And I've always made fun of them for it. Because to me, it's like, why are you needlepointing? We don't need another pillow. We don't need another Christmas tree decoration. Like, do something productive with your life. And your podcast has helped me to not hate them quite as much for all of the <laughs> needlepointed <laughs> pillows we have around the house. Um, I still wish that they'd make something other than pillows, but it's a thing. Um, 
but one of the things that you talked about in one of your recent episodes was darning and this idea of taking something that you love and putting more love into it so then you can love it some more. And there's a really great quote that you said, and it was, we think of things as perfect until we wear them, but really we, we think of things as perfect until we wear them. See, this is where punctuation comes in, folks. If I had just put a comma there, I would have gotten it right. <laughs> try this again. We think of things as perfect until we wear them, but really they're lifeless. And and then we wear them, right? Then we we breathe life into them. So how do you how does that relate to books? Like, how do you feel? I know people who don't like used books because somebody once told me, I think this was my mother actually, she doesn't like used books because it feels like someone's used underwear. And uh, right, I know. And I hadn't thought about that, but how does that feel to you about a book? Like, do you feel like your book on the shelf has life? Or do you feel like we really need to interact with it and play with it and highlight it and like dog ear it? Like, are you a dog ear? Tell me about how that works with books. So this is a good question. Firstly, I have to give some credit to Kate Fletcher for that quote, because that is a, a Kate Fletcher concept. She's a brilliant okay. textiles historian. And she came up with this idea that clothing is just a blank canvas until we get the creases in the elbows and the little rub bits on the on the other side of the elbows. So I used to be a books have to stay perfect kind of gal. And I have some very special first edition books or books that my dad gave me when I was a child or kind of those books that nobody touches. But I was reading a book and trying to get what I needed from it. And I suddenly realized that I needed to underline everything and turn all the pages down and scribble on it because otherwise I wouldn't be extracting from it what I needed. Mm. And I've, I've since, um, when I was doing my master's, a mentor of mine lent me a lot of books and I loved finding her notes in the margin because I'd just be like, oh, Jane underlined that bit. Why is that bit important? Or why has she put an F there? What does that mean? Um, it stood for feminism. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I was like, wait, what's the so, F for? There's right? so many possibilities. Right? Um, yeah, so now, I mean, I have a copy of All We Can Save, which is one of my favorite books by Ayanna Elizabeth Johnson and Catherine K. Wilkinson, which is a collection of essays by women about climate change and I mean you can see this on YouTube not on the podcast almost every page is turned out oh, <laughs> that's the sign of a good book to me so um yeah I published a magazine a while ago and we specifically made it small enough that it would fit in people's bags so they could take it with them and rip pages out and turn corners down and yeah I think I think you've got to kind of get in there I mean in an ideal world I guess you'd have a perfect one and one to mess up but <laughs> <laughs> I think that circles back to this idea so I think as you were talking, I realized one of the reasons I don't write in my books and don't dog ear them is because I don't keep my books. When I'm done with a right. book, I hand it off to somebody. Um, and I, I try to keep it so I could send it to the library. Like the library isn't going to take my dog eared book. I want to donate it to the library so the library can either sell it for money or can give to other people to read. But now that I'm thinking about it, I'm like, if I'm passing it along to mostly friends, why not write in it? If I love a passage, they would love to see that too. And I love, like I have a worn copy of Eat, Pray, Love. And I know it's cliche, but Eat, Pray, Love came to me at a time when I desperately like needed to figure out what I wanted to do in this world, what I wanted to believe in. And I was living in Italy the same time Elizabeth Gilbert lived in Italy. So that's what originally had me pick it up. And I was like, oh, this isn't a cliche book. This is actually brilliant. So. I bought a second copy so I could highlight it, so I could write yeah. it. Yeah, so mo I buy most of my books secondhand now, partly for environmental reasons, mm -hmm. but partly because, yeah, I just love having those little stories from other people. It's great. I love that. And I think that, I think I know people who are like, I don't buy books anymore because they're bad for the environment. You know, just like we were talking about the writers. And I think we like to blame us in our one book like that's what that's what the corporations have have convinced us is that me in this one book is what's hurting the environment where i heard a statistic once that 16 ship tanks are the equivalent of carbon emission as all the gases in the world like so, you know 16 freighters and so we think of like our one book as needing to be recycled and yes i want to do that but also like buy the book write in the book have the book dog ear the book like do the things with the book yeah and i think you know there is carbon captured in books. So if we keep them on our bookshelves, that's captured carbon that's not in the environment. Uh -huh. And, you know, and recycling requires energy. So if you're still enjoying that book and still getting value from it, keep it on your bookshelf. 
those of you watching on YouTube will be able to see the extensive collection of books I have behind me. So I might just be defending myself here. <laughs> <laughs> You're like justifying your habit. I get it. Yeah. I'm a, I'm totally a pusher. I'm an enabler. It's okay. I actually, you, as you know, um, I just, and some of y'all know, I just moved into my own place. I bought a condo. I live in my own place for the first time. I've been a nomad. I have not lived in a, since I was 18 and left my home that I had lived in for my whole life. I haven't lived in the same place longer than a year. And usually it's like eight weeks here, six weeks here. Like I prided myself in a nomad life. So I had to get rid of everything. I had nothing. And it feels really cool to be able to like collect things. And as I fill this, you're a person in my life. I've bought everything secondhand. And that feels really great too, to like fill my house with secondhand goods that are high quality secondhand goods. I couldn't afford otherwise. Um, like the desk I'm on, like the sofa pillows that are behind the camera that you can't see because they help with the noise. Um, so I love that just simply by existing, I, you are inspiring people to help make those tiny little changes, right? It took no extra effort for me to go to a consignment store instead of a brand new uh, store and buy stuff. It took no extra money. It actually saved me money to do that. Um, so thank you for that, for being inspiring. Yeah, my pleasure. My house is also full of secondhand furniture. And I think often you get stuff that's far better quality because sort of 50, 100 years ago, people were making furniture of better quality than it's generally made now. And also you get stories. So I've got a, a G plan coffee table that I found in a charity shop thrift store in America. I thrift think. store. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, special American over here. Yeah. For five English pounds. Um, and it's got these coffee marks all the way around it. And I have a friend who's a furniture restorer and he said, oh, do you want me to polish those out? And I was just like, no, that's like 80 years of arguments and love affairs and conversations and heartbreak. And, you know, you can imagine the conversations that have happened over those cups of coffee. Yeah. I love those coffee rings all the way around that table. I love that. I have these um, TV dinner trays that I got. I host writing events in my home now that I have a home. And I got these TV dinner trays that are actually at perfect writing height for you to like journal or type. And they all have little like bits like that on them. And I was like, I love that. Somebody else like use these for whatever they used, TV dinner trays or either TV dinner or maybe they had writing or maybe it was their kids. I don't know. But like you can see the use of it. And that makes me, yeah. that makes me happy. Love it. Amazing. Okay. I could talk to you forever about this, but we're reaching our time. So I have the last three questions that I ask everyone okay. on the podcast. Are you ready for it? Yeah, I'm ready. What is a book that you have recently or not recently, what's a book that you read that you loved and kind of changed your life? So I had a short list of about 20 books. <laughs> you came prepared. I like it. I think I've narrowed it down to one. Okay. But it's kind of one that opened the doors for some others. So I'm going to go with Brené Brown, The Gifts of Imperfection, mm -hmm. yeah. which opened the door to books like Sonia Rene Taylor's The Body Is Not an Apology, uh, Simon Sinek's The Infinite Game, Let My People Go Surfing. And I think the reason that book and all the books it led me to are so powerful is because for the first time I started to understand that I had been trying to live in a box that had been created for a white, straight, cisgender, private school educated, non-disabled man. Mm. And I'd spent my whole life trying to force myself into the structures and systems that we all live in that have primarily been created for that human. And I think reading all of those books and I'm still very much at the beginning of this journey so it feels quite vulnerable to talk about it but it's starting to understand that there's a different way to exist that we can exist as who we are and that can be enough mm. and I think that's um there's a quote in that book that I, at some point I'm going to get tattooed down my forearm I don't have a tattoo I'm 42 this is going to be a big deal which mm. is um the true meaning of courage is to tell the story of who you are with your whole heart mm. And Which that, book is that from? Uh, it's The Gifts of Imperfection the gifts, it does by Brené Brown. Brown. Yeah. Um, and from her TED Talk, The Power of Vulnerability. And I just think, I mean, I've, I've came across that quote 10 years ago and I'm still kind of unpicking it and exploring it and working out what it means. And every time I think I'm there, it's like, oh no, there's a whole nother layer of stuff. Um, but I think there's this whole movement now in, particularly in the online business world and in coaching and in a lot of these newer business books, that it's not about kind of how to make the most money, how to build the biggest business, how to kind of get your face all over the magazines and kind of 
this very sort of patriarchal driven model of success. It's much more about saying, how can we build a life and a business and a career around who we are and what we need and what makes us happy? And so, yeah, I think that book is probably the one that's had the most profound impact. Mm. But I mean, I had a I had a whole list of other books that would have made me sound much cleverer, but that's the honest answer. <laughs> uh, first off, the honest answer is the right answer always. Maybe not always, um, but, pretty, but in, <laughs> in this in this instance, but I, the gifts of imperfection changed my life for sure. Like I read it two years after my brother died. My girlfriend had just left me. I was in a really, really, really bad place. And it was like, oh, wait, like these are gifts, not something I need to beat out of myself or not something I can never fix. So I have to just end my life. Like they were, it was just like one of those aha moments that I'd heard in so many other situations and ways, but there was something about that book at that moment in that way. And the way Brene talks um, was just everything I needed. Yeah. Body yeah. psychology is another one that just like hit me when I needed it. So I love that Simon Sinek. And yeah, I want my, like, let, let your team go surfing. Um, I love, I love everything you just said. So my second to last book question is what's a book that you would love to read, but you don't want to have to write? Okay. So this is a similar answer. I work with a coach called Ray Dodd and she is incredible at kind of working through some of this stuff and the sort of, she's really, really good. So she's got this expression, it's not your fault, but it is your responsibility. Mm. And so she talks about the systemic barriers that exist for people who aren't white, straight, cisgender, public school educated, non-disabled men. Um, you know, and I'm very privileged. I'm only not a few of those things. Um, so it's easier for me than it is for a lot of people. But firstly, she opened my eyes to the fact that these are systemic barriers, not my personal failings, mm. um, which is incredibly powerful. So that's the it's not your fault part, um, which is just like a, a weight being lifted off my shoulders. The it's your responsibility <laughs> part is the tough part. So, OK, it's not your fault. But and if you want to succeed within these systems, firstly, of course, we have to challenge them and we have to try to change them. Um, and then we also have to work out ways to navigate them without having to force ourselves back into that box. And she is brilliant at helping and empowering women to do that. And at some point, I'm really hoping she's going to write a book because that is the book that I want to read. She's talked about writing a book. I'm saying this publicly on a podcast to maybe... We're calling you out. What was her name? <laughs> Ray Dot. Ray Dot. <laughs> <laughs> write your friggin' book already. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I would love to read her book um, because I think it's what so many people like us who are navigating the business world and building careers within this sort of structure need to A, have that weight lifted off their shoulders that it's not their fault and B, empower them that actually there is something they can do about it. I love it. I'm excited about that book. So Ray... We're here to have you on the podcast. When you're <laughs> and then last, but certainly not least, how do we connect with you? If people are want to find your books and want to find out about you, how can they connect with you? So my books should be available in small, independent, wonderful bookshops. Of course, you can buy them they online. Are in the United States, for sure. You can get it they through are. the bookshop.org link that we have for you amazing and if you have a local bookshop that doesn't stock it you can ask them to stock it so you can ask them to order one in for you and they will usually be able to do that um in the online space i am at katiedragon.one on instagram uh i have an e-newsletter called can craft save the world which you can sign up for at katiedragon.com and that comes out i say weekly ish because i'm trying to embrace this new imperfect <laughs> model um and as we mentioned, my podcast is Circular with Katie Tregeden. And no, talking about yourself in the third person never gets less weird. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't. It do really doesn't. doesn't. Um, we'll have all of those links for all y'all in the show notes. So we'll and we'll link to Katie everywhere on our Instagram and our YouTube. So you'll be able to get that if y'all can't didn't write that down. Just click the show notes and we'll get it. If you're you. listening to the podcast in the bath, like I do. <laughs> right? yeah. They're in the show notes. Bath I do it on walks and I usually like, it would hurt if I am taping everything up. So we got that for you folks. 
Katie, I just love you as a human. So I'm so glad that you were willing to come on and chat with everybody. And thank you again so much for coming on today. And this was, I learned so much and I just love having conversations with you. So thank you for existing and for coming on the podcast. Uh, right back at yeah. Thank you so much for having me. Have a great day, everybody. Bye. Hey, everyone. It's Stephanie, writer from the 2020 group of Write Your Friggin' Book Already and current coach and cheerleader of the 2021 Write Your Friggin' Book Already group. And I'm here with my favorite thing, a book review. And this week, I'm recommending The Shadow of the Wind by Carlos Ruiz Zafon. So this book, my mom actually read originally and recommended it to me. I read it years ago, but the feeling of it still sticks with me. And it's part of a series called Cemetery of Forgotten Books. And I didn't know that at the time. So when I went to look for another book by this author, I was very surprised to know that it was part of a series, but he wrote it so they could be read together or a standalone books. So you can just read one, you can read all of them. And it takes place in Spain and it's got a, it's a book about books and it has a mystery and kind of like a haunted house and a love story. And it's a great escape, a great break from your day. So if you want to read The Shadow of the Wind, you can look in the show notes to click on the bookshop.org link. Easy for me to say, which supports local independent bookstores and supports the School for Writers podcast. If you prefer audiobooks, you can click the link to go to libro.fm. And there you can get a free audiobook for yourself, and then we get one too. Hope everyone is having a great day and happy reading, everyone. Awesome.